History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno. Lecture 10. Negative Universal History. December 10th, 1964. Ladies and gentlemen, last time I tried to show you that theories of universal history, such as Hegel's, have a lot more to be said in their favor than we are inclined to think at first sight. Even though from a positivist standpoint, they may seem to be guilty of arbitrariness or naivety. I should now like to go on to explore a number of what I like to think of as far more valid objections to the construction of universal history. I believe that I pointed out in an earlier lecture that these objections are to be found in Benjamin's essay on the concept of history, an essay which still appears in the Benjamin edition under the title of Theses on the Philosophy of History. Benjamin himself had evidently fixed on on the concept of history as the definitive title, although in his letters he always spoke of the theses on the philosophy of history. I believe that it would be a good idea for me simply to read out to you the relevant thesis, and at the same time to alert you to the fact that Benjamin is attempting here to formulate a materialist conception of history, albeit one that is shot through with theological ideas that are presented in terms of a highly negative dialectic. It is not possible for me to explore this amalgam of materialism and theology at this moment, although I am fully aware that by failing to do so, I run the risk that the very things I wish to emphasize may seem, shall we say, somewhat arbitrary to you, and their utterly compelling logic will fail to make itself fully apparent. But when all is said and done, I have to make sure that I stick to the topic of these lectures so as not to stray too far from what you have every right to expect from them. Thesis 12, or no, wait, 17, I think it's 17, states, historicism rightly culminates in universal history. It may be that materialist historiography differs in method more clearly from universal history than from any other kind. I should note in passing that there is something faintly naive or even usurpatory about the expression materialist historiography, since the predominant official form of materialist historiography, that is to say the historical writings of Marx and Engels and their successors, is very much within the tradition of universal history that descends from Hegel. In fact, it makes a virtue of it, this means that Benjamin is attempting to enlist the authority of a materialist conception of history for an approach, his own, that is just as heretical when looked at from the position of Marxist practice as it is critical of traditional historicism. Universal history, i.e. historicism, has no theoretical armory. While that is not something that can be said of Marxism, despite Benjamin's strong sympathy for Marxism, particularly in his late phase, it is astonishing to see just how undeveloped his knowledge of Marxist theory is. Instead, he worked out a, a version of Marxism that it would be unfair to juxtapose to Marx's own theory. By the same token, however, he did himself no favors by thinking of himself as an orthodox Marxist. But these are dogmatic quibbles that we need not go into here. The only point worth making in this connection is to note that it is an absolute travesty to attempt, as we find in the Eastern Bloc countries, to claim Benjamin in support of beliefs which, for the most part, fly in the face of ideas that have been elevated there to the status of dogma. Benjamin continues, Its procedure is additive. It musters a mass of data to fill the homogen homogeneous, empty time. Of course, as I hope I have shown you, no such claim can be made for universalizing philosophy of history in the broadest sense, such as Hegel's. But now we have reached the nub of the question, the really interesting bit. Materialist historiography, on the other hand, is based on a constructive principle. Thinking involves not only the movement of thoughts, we might say the movement of the time continuum, but the rest as well. Where thinking suddenly comes to a stop, in a constellation saturated with tensions, it gives that constellation a shock by which thinking is crystallized as a monad. The historical materialist, Benjamin says, approaches a historical object only where it confronts him 
as a monad. I may perhaps remind you of what I said last time about my own belief that, especially in philosophical speculations about history, it was far more important to immerse oneself in particular phenomena than to elaborate universal structures. I am sure that you will take note of the affinity between my own way of thinking and that of the principles stated here by Benjamin. In this structure, the Benjaminian materialist recognizes the sign of a messianic arrest of happening, or, to put it differently, a revolutionary chance in the fight for the oppressed, ma oppressed past. Of course, you might say that here we have a universalizing motif, since in these theses what Benjamin perceives is the uninterrupted history of oppression. Although, on the other hand, this unifying aspect is perceived only as something negative, and as something that he pers persistently disputes in the thesis that I am reading to you here. He takes cognizance of it, of this chance, in order to blast a specific era out of the homogeneous course of history. Thus, he blasts a specific life out of the life work. As a result of this method, the life work, let us say the artist's or thinker's life work, is both preserved and sublated in the work, that is, in the individual specific work, the era in the life work, in the entire course of history in the era. The nourishing fruit of what is historically understood contains time in its interior as a precious but tasteless tasteless seed. What we have here, I would like to add, is nothing less than a theory that makes its appearance in Benjamin in a dogmatic form, but one whose validity can be demonstrated very cogently. His idea is that, contrary to what traditional philosophy believed, facts do not simply disperse in the course of time, unlike immutable, eternal ideas. The truth is that, while the traditional view inserts facts into the flow of time, they really possess a nucleus of time in themselves. They crystallize time in themselves. What we can legitimately call ideas is this nucleus of time within the individual crystallized phenomena, something that can only be decoded by interpretation. In accordance with this, we might say that history is discontinuous in the sense that it represents life perennially disrupted. However, because history constantly repeats this process of disruption, and because it clings to the resulting fragments instead of its deceptive surface unity, the philosophical interpretation of history, in other words, the construction of history, acquires a view of the totality that the totality fails to provide at first sight. At the same time, history detects in these fragments the trace of possible developments, of something hopeful that stands in precise opposition to what the totality appears to show. In Hegel, this discontinuity is hinted at in his theory of the spirits of the peoples that succeed one another in turn, a theory I shall return to. We may say, and here Benjamin may be justified in claiming to be a materialist, that the awareness of discontinuity goes hand in hand with the growing doubts about the possibility of understanding history as the unified unfolding of the idea. In general, the continuous structure of history is based on the assumption that a particular idea runs through history in its entirety, and that the various facts gradually come closer to it. The more this way of thinking is resisted, together with its tendency towards idealization, the less will historians be tempted to think of history as a continuum, a continuum in which the idealism, the affirmative element, lies in the belief that things are getting better all the time. Put in general terms, the consciousness of discontinuity is simply that of the prevailing non-identity. This non-identity is the opposition between whatever is held down and the universal domination that is condemned to identity. And if history is looked at materialistically as the history not of victories but of defeats, we will become incomparably more conscious of this non-identity than was true of idealism. The task of a dialectical philosophy of history, then, is to keep both these conceptions in mind, that of discontinuity and that of universal history. This means that we should not think in alternatives. We should not say history is continuity or history is discontinuity. We must say instead that history is highly continuous in discontinuity, 
in what I once referred to as the permanence of catastrophe. In Benjamin himself, I have discovered a sentence that comes very close to this when he speaks of the angel of history, the Angelus Novus, who seems about to move away from something he stares at. His eyes are wide, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how the angel of history must look. His face is turned toward the past. Where a chain of events appears before us, he sees one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it at his feet. In this image, a magnificent one, incidentally, which grandly encompasses history as a whole in a way that is easily compatible with a monadological viewpoint, Benjamin finds an authentic expression for the union of the, of the continuity and discontinuity of history. It is similar to at least one aspect of Hegel's theory, and in fact the resemblance is much more than casual, even though we may suppose that Benjamin's knowledge of Hegel was not very detailed. The resemblance is to be found in Hegel's doctrine that identity is not simply identity, but the identity of identity and non-identity, in other words, of concept and thing, since for Hegel the concept is the identity. Admittedly, and this admittedly which sounds like a minor reservation, actually embraces a world of difference. The opposite situation obtains in Benjamin, and if I may add without immodesty, the same thing may be said of my own theory. The position is not that an identity rules, which also contains non-identity, but non-identity is a non-identity non -identity of the identical and the non-identical. Thus, non-identity includes what gives history its unity, what enables it to accommodate itself to the concept as well as what it doesn't. For the very things that subjugate and submit, these very acts of subjugation and submission in which identity is torn apart, forge the identity of history of which we speak and which we must describe as negative identity. Simply to erase universal history from our thinking about history, and in this respect, I disagree with what Benjamin says explicitly, although the opposite is objectively implied in his writings, would be to blind oneself to the course of history, the storm of history of which he speaks. We would blind ourselves just as effectively as by doing the opposite, namely by subsuming the facts of history into its overall course, which is what I have shown Hegel to have done, without emphasizing the non-identical side of history, since to do this confirms the course of history by the way in which it ignores individual fates. Thus the task is both to construct and to deny universal history, or to use yet another Hegelian term, one used to refer to public opinion in the philosophy of right. Universal history is to be respected as well as despised. The domination of nature, which incidentally is mentioned in one of Benjamin's theses, welds the discontinuous, hopelessly splintered elements and phases of history together into a unity while at the same time its own pressure senselessly tears them asunder once more. I would remind you of the quotation from Sickingen that I mentioned to you at the start of these lectures, not without cause. We might say that in its development hitherto, History is constructed like a gigantic process involving the exchange of cause and effect. It is as if the principle of exchange were not only the, the determining factor in the countless myriad of actions that constitute the life of human beings, but as if the macro structure, the macrocosmic nature of history were itself just one great exchange relationship in which penance follows the act of taking, so that in this sense history never escapes from the bonds of myth. This was a presentiment, incidentally, that was not alien to the early philosophers. Look, for example, at some of the documents of the early Greek philosophers of the pre-Socratics, if you take the famous saying of Anaximander, and also certain statements of Heraclitus, and look at them from the standpoint of the philosophy of history and not just of ontology, as is the fashion nowadays, you'll get something of a sudden insight into the exchange structure of history. We might even define the need to escape from this process of exchanging like for like as the telos of history, namely as the goal of liberating history from everything that history has been up to now. If you read the newspapers and are able to imagine what is involved in the events in the Congo, 
you can reflect on the balance of horror between the atrocities committed by the natives and those committed by the forces of civilization by way of revenge. This will give you a direct insight into a contemporary instance of this situation. Not even the sanitized reports that have reached us can conceal the reality entirely. The cheers that greeted the liberation of Stanleyville by the Belgian Paris are just as revolting as the mendacious claims by the Eastern camp that liberating Stanleyville from the natives and their atrocities was manifestly an instance of European imperialism. This too ignores the facts by failing to see the dialectic of history here, this wretched exchange relation. The two positions are equally repugnant and despicable. I would say that if you have a free relation towards history, and I venture to say that in the sense in which I have tried to explain it to you, the philosophy of history is this freedom towards history that would enable you mentally to rise above these two possibilities, above, part of, above partisanship in this restricted sense. The definitive threat to organized humanity by other organized human beings that we can see approaching in our time coincides with absolute continuity because the history of the mastery of nature really does culminate in such conflicts, just as it goes hand in hand with absolute discontinuity. In other words, with the fact that here the thread of history threatens to break and to break once and for all. In a society that has become societalized through and through, this discontinuity becomes evident in a far more specific sense. It is not necessary here to raise the specter of the ultimate catastrophe over a precipitate Pers sorry, over precipitately, I should like to add. There's a certain hubris, an intellectual hubris, in evoking the possibility of a total catastrophe, which we can barely imagine, only to leap in just when intellectual solutions seem exhausted and propose some universal formula, even a negative one. On the one hand, total nuclear meltdown satisfies a need that is not so very different from that of an abstract utopia. But when we say that history is the union of continuity and discontinuity, and not either one of the two, we can see something of the sort in our own day. For, on the one hand, we can see how the power of totalitarian societies is growing in a way that cannot be misinterpreted, even if it does not always coincide with political control. On the other hand, we simultaneously perceive, through the fog of these totalitarian systems, something like a collapse of crucial historical forces into irreconcilable particularities. My late friend Franz Newman advanced an argument of this kind in his book, Behemoth, a book that I would like to commend, you, commend to you as a significant source for the philosophy of history. His principal thesis there is that the national socialist state appears to be the very model of the absolute unification of society among current dominant regimes. In reality, however, despite its leader principle and everything that goes with it, the unity that had developed more or less anonymously in a, in, a li in a liberal society permeated by monopolies now disintegrates into the rule of rival cliques or power bases that cannot really be brought together under a common denominator, a common unified state structure. It would be my view that this tendency for society to break down into a number of competing overpowerful groups will continue for the foreseeable future. They have long since passed the point where they can be synthesized into a higher concept, and nor is there any possibility of a reconciliation in sight. When people nowadays speak of rule by interest groups, to use the term coined by Eschenberg in the very important book in which he has analyzed this phenomenon, they may well mean what I have in mind here. And perhaps I may add a further point. The term pluralism is acquiring increasing currency in our own time. It is presumably the ideology describing the centrifugal tendencies of a society that threatens to disintegrate into unreconciled groups under the pressure of its own principles. This is then represented as if it were a state of reconciliation in which people lived together in harmony while in reality society is full of power struggles. As a minor byproduct of these lectures, I would like to recommend that you adopt an extremely wary attitude towards the concept of pluralism, which, like the similar concept of social partners, is preached at us on every street corner. To transfigure an 
and ide ideologize the elements of discontinuity or of social antagonisms in this way as part of the general ideological trend. In the same way, it is very characteristic of our age that the very factors that threaten to blow up our entire world are represented as the peaceful coexistence of human beings who have become reconciled and have outgrown their conflicts. This is a tendency which barely conceals the fact that mankind is beginning to despair of finding a solution to its disagreements, but all that is really by the by. I would like to add that under the rule of the, of the one principle, namely the world spirit, in the negative sense that I have explained to you, the elements that elude the world spirit, that is to say the elements that I have been trying to explain to you, the individual elements, the individual group phenomena into which the great historical process fragments, begin themselves to take on something of a contaminated, doom-laden aspect. It would be altogether too primitive, and I would explicitly like to warn you against any simplistic acceptance of what I have said up to now, since it would be all too easy for some of you to believe that this is what I had intended. It would be simplistic if you were to assume that, in what I have called the historical process, or the world spirit that gives shape to the, to the totality and draws it into itself, it is the particular that is in the right, and has the right of human destiny on its side, while the totality is in the wrong. If you reflect for a moment on what I, what, on what I said at some length previously, namely that the totality preserves itself and prevails through conflict, that is to say through the enduring persistence of particularity, you will be able to dispel an illusion about particularity. It remains true that historical particulars are constantly the victims of the general course of history. As against this, the overall course of history is only possible because the particulars necessarily harden out and become inflexible, whether they will or no. In this sense, we can say that the particular deserves the totality in which it finds itself. This too is an idea that I have tried to explain to you from a different angle, namely from the idea that the social totality, totality comes to prevail through the actions of individual human beings. I should now like to focus on this a little more closely. The situation is that where the non-identical still takes the form of what are more or less natural categories, which incidentally are not at all natural in actual fact, they are merely relics from older historical epochs. These non-identical elements that have not yet been absorbed into the historical process go rancid and become poisonous. They go rancid much as the universal principle does, does when confronted with them. This too we may test against the recent events in Africa. If indeed we can pluck up the courage to do so, something that is not altogether easy. It is really the case that, under the rule of the totality, even the particular that opposes it nevertheless collaborates in weaving the web of disaster. It does so not just by lapsing into particularity, but by degenerating into something poisonous and bad. That is to say, these natives who are running wild in Africa for the last time are not one whit better than the Paris, than the barbaric paratroops who are struggling to make them see reason i.e. to accept the benefits of a progressive civilization in a manner that is familiar to all of you. This is a dialectic that we should all fix in our minds. We might go even further and say that whatever fails to fit in with the, no with the dominant principle finds itself reduced to the level of mere chance. The great historical trend sucks the marrow out of everything oppositional and recalcitrant, and what gets left behind is something insignificant lacking in substance and thus a random affair. Mm -hmm. I believe that in this context, we should dwell on the idea of chance for just a moment. Mm -hmm. Chance plays a part in history because we mm -hmm. always have to ask ourselves about the role of chance mm -hmm. events in history. Mm -hmm. For example, during the recent World mm -hmm. War, one had the feeling as an outside observer mm -hmm. that there were countless moments when the fact that Hitler mm -hmm. was losing seemed to be attributable mm -hmm. to chance. However, it then appeared that it was only through these chance mm -hmm. events that the great trend, by which mm -hmm. I mean the greater industrial potential of the Western mm -hmm. world, succeeded in prevailing mm -hmm. against Hitler's bid to conquer the world. Mm -hmm. If I may return to the concept of the spell that holds sway over history, mm 
and that I have attempted to explain to you. I would say that chance is the form taken by freedom under a spell. As long as the spell of history lasts, whatever is immune to the spell is mutilated and defeated. It is stripped of meaning, blind, and therefore a matter of chance. All the non-identical phenomena that are expelled as a result of the domination of the identity principle are nevertheless mediated by the power of that principle. What persists are the stale remnants left over once the process of identification has taken its share. And even these stale remnants are left mutilated, scarred by the power of the principle of identity. The spell cast by the identity principle by the world spirit to formulate it even more emphatically perverts whatever is difficult. And even the smallest quantity would be incompatible with the spell if it were still pure. This other... This other then becomes something evil and pernicious, because it is a random thing. This non-identical remnant then becomes so abstract that in its abstractness it converges with the law of identification. This is the truth implicit in Hegel's doctrine of the unity of chance and necessity, a doctrine which he intended positively as praise of the world spirit, though to be sure he did not really intend to say what I am suggesting here. Chance coincides with necessity only where both are equally bereft of meaning, equally external and equally unreconciled. The replacement of the traditional laws of causality by statistics whose core, even in its own terminology, is the principle of chance, can provide us with proof of the convergence of chance and a victorious necessity. But what chance and necessity have lethally in common is what metaphysics refers to as fate. Fate has its place. It is a negative concept. I believe that this is the dividing line separating thought from all mythologizing notions of fate, such as Heidegger's in his Holderlin interpretations. Fate has its place in the sphere in which the thinking of rulers holds sway, as well as in the realm of those who fall outside that sphere and for those who, having been abandoned by reason, acquire an irrationality that barely differs from the irrationality of the necessity insisted upon by the subject. The scraps of a subjugated nature that have been spewed out by the process of domination are just as deformed as those that are, the gr- that are ground down by the machinery. Only true understanding would be superior to the two. It would stand in for a state of the world, true understanding which of course would not amount to actual reconciliation because knowledge alone is not the same as reconciliation but true understanding would stand in for a state of the world in which everything that exists would cease to exist merely for others this is because it would no longer remain content with its own existence for itself its separation and particularity thus reflection on difference would help towards reconciliation, what Horkheimer once called happy reflection. This is what would help rather than extirpation and the elimination of the totality. Hegel, on whom we have to some extent been basing these remarks, was surely aware of this. Despite his praise of totality, he always insisted on its abstract nature. In so doing, he wished to remind us of what is left out out of the totality. The grandiose nature of Hegel's project both its reprehensible and conciliatory aspects, lies in his attempt to include the non-identical in identity, as I tried to show in the quotation that I gave you a few moments ago. Thanks to this attempt, the non-identical itself is taken possession of the spell, while, on the other hand, it becomes the factor that enables the abstract spell to be attenuated. I believe that we should now move on to make a closer examination of how this attempt to gain Reconcil- or recognition for concrete reality in history looks in detail under the spell of the totality, under the spell of the principle of identification. We shall find that the Hegelian philosophy itself has provided us with a paradigm and the shape of the concept with which it sought to grasp the process of history, the concept namely of the spirit of the peoples, who are supposed to succeed each other in turn and in which, according to his theory, the world spirit actualizes itself. We shall see, I fear I have to tell you, that this magnificent project to spell out his conception of history ends up in its very opposite. 
namely in a reinforcement, a theoretical reinforcement of the acts of suppression that characterize history. Next time then I shall talk about the concept of the spirits of the peoples and the philosophy of the history of the nation.